Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast special Saratoga and Del Mar meet preview slash lifestyle edition. We couldn't figure out how to get the theme song to play. So you'll if you're listening live, you didn't get it. Uh, hopefully we can see if producer Craig and or AJ will be able to graft it on for the version of this show that will appear in iTunes but very special edition. We're doing this as a webinar. That means you can use the software to ask us questions. Um, we'd love to answer a bunch of questions throughout. I'll be looking at them. Uh, lots of stuff to do. I'm Peter Thomas Fornatel. I've lost track of the show numbers. We haven't had many lately, but we're going to be getting back onto the good foot. I'm going to take a wild guess. It's show 351, Tuesday, July 17th. I'm in the overheated Brooklyn bunker, making my way up to Saratoga tomorrow, and joining me on the phone, um, you know him, you love him, the people's champion, he makes a DRF hat more famous than a DRF man can, Jonathan Kitchen. What's up, JK? PTF, what's going on? Uh, excited about this, looking forward to a little Saratoga, a little Del Mar, a little bit more Saratoga. It's always a lot of fun. This is a, a lot of a really great meet. Both of them are. It's some of my best memories in racing have taken place either at Del Mar and or Saratoga. They are both magical, uh, and they're places that are exceptions to the rules. So much in modern racing. There are other exceptions, certainly Keeneland coming to mind. But so much of racing these days, you can certainly have a good day out at a lot of places. But by and large, racetracks are de facto TV studios. Not the case at both Saratoga and Del Mar, really uh, palaces of the sport where true racing fans center a lot of their year round. I know for me this year that, I mean, I, I might handle as much in the first weekend of Saratoga as I have in the entire months leading up into this time. I think it's that way for a lot of players. Very exciting. We want to talk about what makes these meets special. We want to talk about some of the specifics in terms of handicapping. We want to answer your questions. At the very end of the show, we'll have some specific conversation about the uh, about the, the races that are going to take place on these opening days. JK, are you watching through the webinar software right now while we do the show. Can you see, is my screen share working? I just wanted to confirm that before before I, I dove in. No, I think so. All I see is just like the DRF Players podcast beat preview. Okay. Just let, me, let me figure out how to – I haven't done this in a while. I often have uh, I often have help when we're doing this. Not a lot of uh, sexy screen share things, uh, to be honest. It's more about that direct interaction but I do want to see if I can't figure out how to do this. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for the show here. Um, hopefully I'll get this figured out very quickly. While I play with that, J.K., let's start off with, with a question for you very specifically about what's different. Uh, let's start out west with the Del Mar meet. Over the years, particular angles that you have, uh, that you have done well with at the at the Del Mar meeting, what kinds of things are you looking for? Yeah, one of my favorite things at Del Mar um, is is it usually, and I don't, you know, I'm not a, I, I will play the turf, but I don't love the turf. But I feel like I kind of have some things I understand about the turf course there. Um, I think one of the things is is that horses that move on the straightaways there uh, typically in two turn races. Uh, get better trips than the horses that are more of the kind of the, uh, the the turn running closer type. So that can count for horses that are forward on the you know that that pop away from there that that uh, get their position going forward in that first straightaway, and then also horses that maybe you can find some hidden middle moves or some riders who kind of understand that getting that position going into the turn and using your horse a little bit on the backside is actually something that can be advantageous and, and, and jockeys that come to mind when it comes to the, to that situation, Kent DeSormo, Corey Nakatani, uh, Flavian Pratt uh, is, is picking up on it a little bit. It feels like he, he rides the turf course there really well. And then also understanding the difference between the six and a half downhill turf races that a lot of these turf sprinters are coming out of and then now running going the flat five, uh, which is significantly sharper for lots of different reasons uh, down at Del Mar. So being able to identify 
uh, horses that are overbet based on their down the hill form. Uh, and then horses that are being underbet based on their down the hill form can really present some good opportunities on the grass at Del Mar. I like it. And I, I think that's right. That six and a half on the downhill often can play like a mile. That type of horse that can excel in under those circumstances very often is going to find five furlong turf sprint too sharp. I want to back up and I want to talk to you about something you said early, talking about horses who are making their move. Um, I think you said making the move on the back stretch as opposed to making the move on the turn. Is that what you said? And it is, yeah. You identify them. I'm assuming maybe Timeform US, which I just pulled up, might be a tool that you'd be able to use to to make uh, to ascertain something like that. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, the only way you can really do it is try to look for some changes in between the race calls uh, on on the. Uh, uh, with the pace figures on time form us that's one way you could do it the other way you can do it is just the old school way looking at tape looking at horses that that uh that you, they kind of catch your eye um on the sh on on the back side rather than their moves they move into the turn making their their sustained move rather than a horse that kind of make does all their running on the turn um so you, you want to try to identify those either visually or, or possibly through some clues with pace figures I like that you're seeing now on the screen. If you're watching along, the way you the array of pace figures is presented in time form US. Feel free to peek down, JK, and if see if there's anything that like stands. You know, don't don't uh, you know don't go nuts here. But if you see something that you can point out based on any of these arrays of pace figures that that points to what you're talking about, I think. Folks might be able to learn something and feel free to look on your own end. And if you want to send me to a horse that we can we can demonstrate either now or later in the show, um, you know, feel feel free to do that. Because I, I think it's it's interesting. It's, it sounds like a type of next level form analysis that we don't really get to talk about too much. And, and it's interesting that that ties in so well to Del Mar. I think your point about the turf sprints is much more intuitive. People are going to see, oh, that's a, this is a turf sprint, that's a turf sprint. Well, they're actually very different animals, and we'll get to that again later when we're talking it, about Saratoga. To, to your question, and not to get ahead of ourselves here, looking at the ocean side, which I think you have pulled up there, if you look at the five-horse Desert Stone, uh, a lot of positives here. One, Corey Nakatani shows up, uh, which is one of those riders that I, I kind of named as, as one that gets it. And if you look at his pace figure two back uh may 11th and i think you're probably viewing it the same way i am yes you'll see kind of that jump from 68 to 81 or or in uh right there in the second one 68 to 81 um or in, in even 81 to 92 that's kind of that middle of the race move that can give me a little bit of a hint that that horse uh could be live for sure and not to mention it's closing into closing into blue fractions which we talk about on the podcast all the time Absolutely. It is a good illustration of time form with this horse. That's what we always talk about that as a potential positive. The horse closing when the fractions are co coated blue, theoretically disadvantageous situation. That race may be even a little bit better than the bear form suggests. You look at the, the, the previous race where a horse is closing and those early numbers are red. That's one where uh, you know, my inclination, though it doesn't necessarily seem the case with this horse and there's other things that go into it, but my inclination when you see the one closing and the fractions are red is to say maybe that horse uh, was the the derogatory phrase I might use is is uh, clunking up. Though in this horse's case, that that that's not accurate. I mean, this is one who I think that was just off the layoff and was just sort of getting the, the legs under him as, as the race went on. But that's some of the stuff we like to look at when we look at time form us. Let's talk a little more about Del Mar. If you, if you had a point to piggyback, go for it. Yeah, just real, real quick. The other thing that you can look at in those situations is you want to find horses that have run well on the Del Mar turf course prior. Um, and that's the real easy one. That's the, you know, look up to your PPs in the top right corner in the box and look for horses that have run well at Del Mar. And a lot of times that can help you find, uh, find one that, that might uh, appreciate the, the configuration of that course. I think there's two things that go into that too, JK. Yes, of the, the classic idea of there being horses for courses. Del Mar notoriously uh, quirky little seaside track, as Andy Byer once referred to it. There are certain horses that just seem to get over it better. The other thing I think that looking at those numbers and examining the local form can help you with, especially with meets like Del Mar and Saratoga, there's no doubt there are certain trainers who just 
point for those meets. I, I had a trainer friend uh, once tell me, uh, talking to Beth Saratoga, but I think that the idea probably applies to some degree to Del Mar too, that a win there is worth three, a win at Saratoga worth three at, at Belmont. And as such, they will point to that meet. And what does that mean? Does it mean they're not trying to win at Belmont? No, but it means they're going to probably be likely to reach peak fitness at the target meet and pull out all the stops to, to win at that target meet. So sometimes you can you can just sort of understand a trainer's mindset when looking through the PPs and see, okay, this one's likely to make a step forward here today. And then there's other trainers, and really there's no substitute um, except looking through uh, old PPs, which of course is very easy to do on DRF Formulator. There are those certain trainers you'll see will use a start at the beginning of the meet to prep themselves to do better in their second start of the meet. Uh, Jim Mazur, a trainer analyst who I've uh, read a lot of his work over the years and, and interviewed many years ago for a book called Six Secrets of Successful Betters, along with Frank Scatoni, described them as there are certain trainers at the meet that he described them as hares. They, they come out, they hit the ground running. Others who he described as tortoises, who will sometimes take a race and then the, the second start in the meet um, have an opportunity to, to really show their stuff. Let's talk a little bit specific about, we'll return to some uh, trainer angles and other things as I open up the formulator card for Saratoga. But let's talk a little bit about specific trainers who you're looking for to do well this Del Mar, JK. Is there anybody who you expect is heading to this meet loaded for bear? Well, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people obviously point to this meet. I think the names that you're used to in, in Southern California are the ones that you should continue to keep your eye out for. Obviously, Bob Baffert will will have his fair share. Hollendorfer, Peter Miller, um, Doug O'Neill, Simon Callahan. All of those guys are uh, are ones that you want to keep an eye, an eye out for. Uh, for people that don't play the West Coast much, I don't think Phil D'Amato is still a secret. Uh, if you weren't aware of uh, Phil D'Amato, you, you should be. Uh, Mike McCarthy. Uh, with with some of the races he's he's been shipping around and winning big races and running big in races he had the lieutenant run well at Belmont uh, he had Axelrod win at Indiana he won a couple of grade ones this year with City of Light he's one that I would definitely keep an eye out for as well too he gets a lot of nice young horses he, he comes from the the school of Todd Pletcher so what Todd does at Saratoga uh, obviously with with more horses uh, you know, Mike has the same ability to do so at, at, at Del Mar. So I would keep an eye out for that. Uh, John Sadler does really well at Del Mar. One of his biggest owners, uh, Ronis Racing, uh, really likes to, to win down there. So there's some aggressive drops from time to time. And then also horses being pointed to spot. So uh, it's a there's an array of them. And, and I think one of the guys mentioned Richard Baltus, who, who, who does well there as well. So uh, definitely a, a tough group. And – is do you find Del Mar is much like Saratoga? You'll find trainers that just go on crazy heaters. We've seen each of the last two years, especially two years ago, but to a lesser degree last year, Kieran McLaughlin come out just firing in, in the first few weeks. Back in the day, it used to be that Peter Miller, before Peter Miller was Peter Miller, he would still go to uh, Del Mar. Horses had training uh, comparatively locally at, at uh, San Luis Rey, and he'd come out and win with horses that just didn't necessarily make all that much sense even on paper in those first two weeks at Del Mar, and it became something you had to pay attention to. I think at this point, everybody's paying attention to him, and it feels like he wins, you know, beginning of the meet, middle of the meet, and end of the meet. But are there any – do you think that's that's correct? Is it right with these trainers to look for sort of mini streaks within the meet? Yeah, you want to see where, you know, where they're pointing. They're, they're all, on, you know, they have their horses on schedules. And so uh, if their two-year-olds are running well, then then there's other two-year-olds in the barn that are on that same schedule that are probably ready then. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, one of the things that I'll say both about Saratoga and Del Mar is that the workout report is, is extremely important when you're trying to identify which one of these first-time starters uh, or young horses is going to run well or horses that, that are coming in off a really long layoffs being pointed to this spot. A lot of times those workout reports can give you some indications of what to expect from those horses. Uh, the same thing happens at, at, at Saratoga that happens at Del Mar. The tricky part is, and it's actually two people that you named, to be honest, uh, Kieran McLaughlin and as well as Peter Miller, 
sometimes train their horses at other locations that the workout report is not available. And those horses can sometimes be sneaky. So uh, I'm guilty of falling in love with the workout report. And if I don't see the horse's name in there and there's a bunch of other horses in there with B plus workouts, I sometimes forget about the horses that are working at San Luis Rey or at Green Tree or, or, or wherever up in Saratoga. And another clue that you have to use, I'm, I'm a big fan, obviously, of these clock reports. I'm showing on the screen now for those watching live where you can access them. Um, and, and I know, JK, for you and for me as well, uh, very hard to, to look at these maiden races without them. But don't forget that the tote board itself is going to offer a lot of clues. Um, especially when you see horses, it's not just a question of, okay, that Todd Pletcher horse is getting bet. It must be live. It's more, it's certainly very significant when his horses get bet very much. So in fact, he's still, I think one or two of them might've lost last year, but there was a record going into last year, I think where 19 of 20 of Pletcher's that had been bet to even money or shorter <laughs> had won in a row or something. But what's really interesting to me about using the tote board is when you're seeing horses get bet down below where they quote unquote should be. And what I use for that, honestly, is as simple as the morning line. When you see uh, you know, maybe not the absolute first flash of the of the tote board. You want to make sure there there's you know a decent amount of money in the pool. But early on in the betting, I will write down the odd on the tote board right next to in my DRF what the morning line is, and you will see horses bet down. It's 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 the poor man's version of the clocker report. Look, I'm a big believer. You're better off having the clocker report. There's so much other great information in there that you're going to be able to use not just today but uh, tomorrow and beyond about how these horses look who they're working with etc but as a basic data point there is signal in the horse was six to one on the morning line and he opens up at three and it's much more valuable when it's a trainer that doesn't have to get bet if it's a Pletcher horse, it's a Pletcher horse. It could mean a lot of things. If it's uh, Ian Wilkes' horse or Tony Dutrow, even obviously excellent horseman, but you don't necessarily expect every two-year-old of theirs, uh, especially, to be getting bet. When they're getting bet, it's significant and it pays to take notice. And yeah. you can even use that idea of if, if you see even a little money on a horse who's been training away from the eyes of clockers, that's very significant. So – uh, you know, a, a McLaughlin that was five to one on the morning line opening up at nine to two or four to one might be more significant than the Pletcher that was five to two opening up at eight to five. If you follow my drift, the, the, you have to sort of interpret this information, but there is signal in it. And I think it probably applies equally to Saratoga and Del Mar. What do you think about uh, what I've been on about here? You, am I on to something? No, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Now, here's the thing, though. And I just came up with this name in my head. You're going to like this. We'll use it a lot. Well, the, the overall theme of it is going to be called summer steam. There's the spa steam version and there's the, and there's the surf steam version. <laughs> More than anywhere else in racing, will you hear about a horse that can't lose that, that, that they really like? Ooh, they really like this one. Ooh, this one outworked. The grade one horse. Ooh, if he breaks, he can't lose. They love it. This is this is so and so's derby horse. <laughs> now look, when that happens, sometimes it's right. But it feels like more often than not that it's not right. Yeah. And situations happen. Uh, these really good freaky horses uh, don't break. Uh, it, it, going five or five and a half, and they need longer, and all these different situations. So uh, in, on, in the turf, they get tripped or they run into a bias. So like Pete said, you're right. I mean, you're going to see horses that can give you clues because they're being bet down. But you also have to be, you know, you have to try to zig when they're zagging and be aware of the steam horses that may still need um, a little bit of help, you know, a, a little bit more time, a little bit more of a circumstance that fits them. Doesn't mean they're not talented, talented horses. I think Enticed was one that got us last year, right? Was that the was that yes. the, uh, the Godolphin horse that got us last year? Absolutely. Uh, we talked. We were the best. It was dis that horse was discussed as you know the best, the best two year old in the barn, and 
the it really, and if you looked at pedigree and if you looked at the horse in the paddock, um, the horse wanted to run longer. It had been working well going shorter, but sometimes, you know, we're, that's where racing can be a little bit different than workouts. And you'll see clockers and you'll see people who know horse flesh get so excited about these great prospects. But sometimes even seven furlongs could be wholly inadequate for, for certain runners. And you definitely want to use the pedigree for, for uh a little bit of extra information in that situation and just try to inform your betting and use common sense. You know, that summer steam horse that everybody's talking about that just gets bet off the board. Am I going to let him beat me? Absolutely not. Am I going to loan a him? Probably not. If he's getting bet to just a crazy, you know, four to five off his five to two morning line, when there's three other horses in the race who can win and we really don't know anything about any of them. Very often those horses can turn into use, but not even key or, you know, use as one of your three A's in the race, as opposed to just going completely overboard. And there are opportunities every year. I feel like with these first time starters with great pedigrees who want to run long with a lot of hype about them. And you'll just see some quick horse who's maybe already had a start and ends up beating that, that steam horse at eight to one. That's something, I mean, I've seen that every year at Saratoga. Now, now, now this is not, this is the podcast, but it's not the podcast. So do we have to do mistake jar donations on this version of the show? I think we should, you know, we, we haven't decided which equine charity is going to get the full benefit of the mistake jar. It's I've got it here. I, 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 it's, 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 well, I'll, 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 I'll donate to it. I mean, I think you should contribute too because you agreed with me. We but wrong. the horse was I, not enticed. Who it was, was Avery, Avery Island. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll put a few, uh, we'll clunk, we'll clunk a few coins in the jar, and we'll, we'll keep that, we'll keep that rocking and rolling. But that is not a one year fad. Now, have you seen similar? You follow Del Mar day in, day out so much more than me. I go up there, I get swept in the vortex, I'm swimming in neighbors' pools. I don't know what's going on half the time. Um, I obviously watch Del Mar, but not as religiously as you. Do you do you feel like you see that same phenomenon in the two-year-old races? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an unfair joke that I'm about to make, but I heard American Pharaoh was going to be really good, too. <laughs> No, well, and he was circumstances, and he was, but it, 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 but it wasn't so much that the steam was wrong that he wasn't good. He just Correct. things happen in racing. Right. It shows, shows how hard it's. The great line in the in the Mike Maloney book, betting with an edge, where he talks about how twice in his life he received correct information that uh, this horse was going to be really something special. Maybe he could go on and even win a triple crown. Uh, hearing this hype before the first race ever happened, they both lost. Uh, you know, referring to uh, Secretariat and American Pharaoh. It's, I think it is the best illustration of why you don't just make that horse a lone A and key everything in your entire day. Around. Yeah, and I think we, we've talked about it before and we don't always follow it, but I think the rule is, is that you use, you use positive information as a potential press or a, or an addition you use negative information on horses that you weren't that you were on the fence about to not use horses that you were going to use you use them anyways and you just kind of let it be a guide and a little bit of a of a of a just a little bit of a shove one way or the other but don't hold don't make wholesale changes based on the information you're getting and i also think back to that point that in my opinion the negative info is typically more right than the positive info I think that's typically right everywhere because everybody sort of has an inherent bias towards liking their horse. So when someone doesn't like their horse, it's more uh, probable, I think, that 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 there's signal in that in that information. Not always the case, and sometimes you know they're, they they can not like a horse. They can be right that the horse isn't one of the best ones in their barn, etc. It can still win on the day. We had a question yeah, about. I, I, oh, you go ahead. Just real quick. We had a guy one time who had two horses in a race, and he said, no shot, and they ran one, two of the exacto. <laughs> and we've so we saw and he's, and he's good. He's a good trainer too. So it's not like it was like some someone who had no clue. Well, people right, and even people who know don't always know. The thing with with that horse Trumpy last summer, uh, 
Uh, you remember that? You remember that situation? I do. I do. Tell that story. They they liked the the Donegal horse, right? The the uh, the one that, that that was good. The one that ended up being good. The one that won a stake. The uh, the one that were in the Breeders' Cups. Uh, Sh- uh, Choke. Was that yeah. the? No, because that was a Pletcher horse. There was a Mott horse in the same race. Let's take a look here. We'll look up. Uh, we'll look up Trumpy. This is the good thing about doing this as a webinar. We have an opportunity to actually look this stuff up and demonstrate something instead of us just going back and forth. But the idea was Barn has two horses, loves one, the other, eh, and and uh, the the eh, went, in truth, in this instance, had an absolutely perfect trip. You know, it was just- I went with the wrong. Another mistake, Jar. I went with the wrong silks. I was right about the yellow. But it was the Zayat baby blue, not the green of Donegal. But I don't remember the horse's name. What's oh, it? the horse was uh, – he, he had a really good, uh, a cool uh, European sire. We're, we're going to get this. We're going to look up Trumpy, and then we'll look at, the, we'll look at who ran in that uh, race. I'm also curious. I don't remember what, if anything, uh, that uh, Trumpy has done since the day that he uh, flushed us at, uh, <laughs> at Saratoga. It might have even been opening weekend uh, last year. Here's Trumpy. Um, we'll have a look. I love playing with Formulator for meat specific stuff. You can go in here, you set the filters, and look at all of George Weaver or Bill Mott's winners at Saratoga and you over the last five years. And when you go and you page through these PPs, sort of like we're doing now, you really um, – you really can't help but learn something. Look at the winners. You will start to see patterns. And certain trainers, especially with, with, with their long shots, you'll start to see things. All right, can you see on screen, was it a horse that finished in the – it was August 5th, so it was not as early in the meet as I thought. August 5th, the fourth race. Now, once you have that information, you can use the formulator charts feature like I'm doing now. I'm, I'm demoing it very quickly, but you can probably uh, – you can probably follow. Hopefully, you can follow along. And of course, this will be archived if you want to go back and look at any of these things that we're doing. August fifth, and then you can you scroll down here to Saratoga. It's really a cool tool. I was right about Choke running second, so at least I was. At least I had part. It was only going to be a half a donation for being on that No, but he wasn't the one that everybody liked. It was it, there. There was another one here, and I'm curious if he turned out. And I think he did. Right, Shoke, which you know, Irish territory. That's right. There you. No, is that right? Was the horse that long? I thought it was a horse that was bet. But if that was Mott, that must have been it. Well, I thought it was. Let's see. Let me go back. I I hit the wrong button and and knocked out of here. So you can now scroll. Irish territory. Scroll down here. Um, What was the number? That was declaration. It was declaration of war, and it was Mott. Yeah, that's, okay. so I, I knew it was – well, I guess it's not a European sire, but you know what I meant. He, yeah. he stands here in Coolmore, America, but – But it's interesting. I mean, so in my memory, and I conflated it, that horse was bet too. But, yeah, clearly here you can even see it in the tote board, a 13-to-1 versus a 22-to-1. The 22-to-1 wins granted with, like, the perfect trip of all trips and show kind of had a wild trip. But anyway, these are just some of the things we look at. Let's move on a little more to talk – oh, no, I had a, another – a very good question that came in across the pike about Del Mar. Somebody asked in, in, uh, if, if it would be based on what you were saying, JK, uh, uh, a horse, a track that rewarded horses that show sort of a sustained pace. In other words, close enough early, but can really finish. Or do you see it as more of a pure front runners track? And, and has that changed at all in recent years for you? You know, I think it's always changed. It's, it's always changing. I think I used to think I knew what it was, but, uh, you know, both actually both tracks, Del Mar and Saratoga, can, can often get a little bit biased with Saratoga with all the rain and Del Mar with, with the, uh, the possibly the myth or the legend about the, about the uh, moisture in the tra- track based on the, on, the, on the tides. But I think both of those tracks can become a little bit biased. And, um, and so it really all depends. I know for a while, Del Mar, when, when the dirt was in there, it was kind of favoring outside horses. So those typical wire jobs you saw in Southern California weren't happening at Del Mar. And Del Mar last year, if I'm remembering right, ha- did have sort of a succession of 
not very good rails, um, which also is typically going to not help, obviously, faint-hearted speed horses get brave and probably is going to reward horses who have that, what you might call sustained pace. Now, that said, I wouldn't go crazy on it. It can change in a heartbeat. You're going to have to pay attention. Am I remembering that right about the rail there? Oh, yeah. It got a little bit better, I think, last year than it was the year before. But um, it's tricky. It, it it changes. And the other thing about Del Mar is they have those meet, they have those those Friday racing where they race so late. Um, and the, the weather changes so drastically there between like the middle of the day and when the sun starts to go down and the breeze starts to come in. Like it, it makes sense that the, the track can be a little bit different on a Friday afternoon than it could be on a Saturday at, at one o'clock. Now, the big bias you want to pay attention to at Saratoga, if it's dry, that we've seen the last bunch of years is, and this is a variety of factors, and, and bias is only one of them, the passivity from riders on the turf that we complain about perpetually, and I think I might have given away a bingo square there, um, is also a, 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 a not insignificant factor here. But there's no doubt in my mind also, when that turf course gets baked, it favors speed. Um, and you will see horses who you wouldn't expect to be able to hang on, hang on. Something to keep an eye on. Could be a totally different deal if we get a rainy summer. So, you know, you're going to have to factor that in. And I will also say this. It, it does seem at the highest classes, at the grade one level, you'll often see horses be able to run through that even when it is happening. But you definitely want to keep an eye on uh, what's going on on that turf course. You might want to play some races for chaos or just include horses who might have any chance. You know, the third best speed still might be a use in case one doesn't break and the rider does something crazy, which happens all the time there, with the other, especially as the summer goes on. I'd be very conscious of that. Uh, random thing that I'm just remembering that, that the rail at Saratoga, I feel like the last two opening weekends wasn't great. It certainly wasn't a highway. Um, you know, keep an eye. All this stuff, again, though, to quote the great Mike Maloney, you know, if you're going to do the bias dance, you better do it on your toes. You better be ready to move and react and change things as we go along because uh, – it, 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 it things can change very quickly and just because it was one way one year doesn't mean it'll be that way another but these are things that I definitely recommend um, players keep uh, at least keep a little bit of an eye on throughout the meet how about you JK any other thoughts on potential biases to look for at either track yeah I mean I think there's a, a rider bias on the east coast as, as well for, for whatever reason uh, Duke would probably say it a little bit nicer or a little bit meaner than I would. The, 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 the New York colony is not as aggressive on the grass when they're going long. It, it feels like they're all <laughs> like just trying to, you know, respect each other's chances and just kind of, uh, let's just, let's, let's, let's save a little bit here. And, and, and I, and, and so very often horses that, that you project to get loose on the front end, uh, end up getting a little bit looser than you might've thought. And even though they might not be good enough on paper to hold off a, a, a three to five Chad or a three to five Todd, it can still happen. And, and, and I think we can all probably remember the time that it's happened to us last year. I mean, I, I can think of two that, that, that I got got in that situation where I just didn't use them. And, and one of them was our, was our, uh, our, uh, our stable mate dot matrix. That's right. That's right. Dot matrix wiring them that day and uh, knocking us out of stuff, continuing that rich tradition that was in such fine feta last year of our friends knocking us out of, uh, of, of important wagers. <laughs> what do you do? All right, so you had that happen a few times last year. We all know what you're talking about. What do you do to try to prevent it from happening this year? How do you try to find that horse to maybe throw in in that situation? Is it just as simple as every horse, you know, you look at Time Form US and you see the you see the grid here, the pace projector I'm clicking on. Is it every horse that's on the lead you make sure you include? Is it is it something more subtle? How do you, uh, how, how, how you want to react to try to catch the dot matrix this year who, who beat us last year? Well, I think that, we get conditioned nine months out of the year to 
try, at least I feel that way. I think some people probably are still working on their game in that way, but try to feel like you, you don't want to be wasteful with inclusions because for all the times you include that you're wrong, you're wasting money. So you, you want to try it on a Thursday or a Saturday with, with one stake race at Belmont or on Tampa Bay Derby Day at Tampa or at Goldstream on a Wednesday. We, we, we play these pick four and pick five and pick six tickets where we try to narrow a little bit because, frankly, you have to. Uh, in a race where there's a one to nine horse, you either have to single the one to nine shot or you, you have to pretty much toss them and spread. You can't really use four horses and the one to nine and use them equally on a on a Wednesday at, at, at Goldstream. It, it, you, you're, the payouts always come up in a way that you don't you, you, it puts you in a funny position from an equity standpoint. What I've learned is that at Saratoga and Del Mar, uh, th there's, there's the, those situations you can afford to kind of add that other horse. Maybe if you just use the horse in a B, in a B, in a B roll or whatever it is, or even a C roll, use those horses that when you're looking down, you say, if this situation happens, and I typically would recommend that being a pace situation, this horse could absolutely win. Um, and, and be very careful because a lot of times when you ask yourself that question, what will happen when you get to these horses? If if they go slow, this horse could probably wire them. And then you keep looking and you say, no, 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 no. If they go slow, Todd, who's three to one, who's going to be forwardly placed, is going to run over this horse late. It doesn't matter how slow they go. Todd's going slow too. He'll beat them. I don't need to use them, but you'll find times where you can do that. Um, and so that, that's kind of it. I would look for opportunities for horses to do things from pace scenarios and, and try your hardest to include them in your ticket. Being a little more inclusive uh, when it comes to a pick four or pick five or whatever it is at meets like these with more money in fattening up the pools, bigger fields. In, in a nutshell, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. You got me at the mute button. Yes, Absolutely. No, absolutely. I, I, I just to give you a heads up. I was not successful in in uh, getting my partner in crime to bed uh, before the show, as I as I speculated I might try. So gotcha, gotcha. That 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 is a okay. I, uh, let's talk some lifestyle stuff, J.K. We've already somehow. I mean, that was a quick forty minutes. <laughs> I was expecting to look down and see it be about twenty five. Always good to pick your brain about these things lifestyle stuff favorite places to eat and drink i'm showing one of mine on the screen right there for the del mar purposes that is the sunset at the pacific coast grill it is a special place up in cardiff producer craig and we had a great meal there around breeders cup time um i would make reservations and i would get myself there the wise guy move um if you can get yourself there with at sunset, I think makes it particularly nice. Um, great cocktails, very good margarita, rock solid beer selection, really cool California. It's actually not all California, the wine list, but it's all Pacific coast in keeping with the name. Um, they've been at it for a long time, but the menu stayed fresh. Uh, I am some of the happiest, some of the lightest my heart has felt in my life has been dining at the Pacific Coast Grill, uh, especially when the owner, Steve Goldberg, is around to to chat with one, one of the good guys. And that's hands down my favorite place to dine at uh, out at Del Mar. What are some of your favorite things at Del Mar? Um, <clears throat> the Market Restaurant, which is is uh, is it's kind of it's on the other side of the highway of Del Mar. So there's yes. like a. Not the one that has the good biscuits, not the seafood spot like right on the corner of where Del Mar is, but it's called Market Restaurant Bar. Uh, that place is, is great. Um, had two really good meals there. Uh, I'm a big this fan one. of, of uh, let me see. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah that place is really good. Uh, and it's kind of fun too. I, you know, I, look, I, I, I was a, before I even got an opportunity to do this show and do other cool stuff, like I was a racing fan first and like, I love going to places and like running into like the racing, you know, who's who. Like I, last time I was, I was at market one time and I was in the table over from us was the Mosses and the Sheriffs and Mike Smith when, when they had the Zenyatta thing at Del Mar. Oh, that's fun. So 
Yes, I interrupted and showed my Zenyatta tattoo, but I, 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 I had to. How could you not? How could you not? Um, yeah, yeah, Bo Derrick. I mean, I've seen I've seen a lot of people there, so that that was fun. Uh, obviously, the Pample move right across the street is great uh, for people that have been following racing for a long time. Uh, the horse, the Pample moves, a three-year-old that was around. God, I don't remember what year it was. Maybe 2006, seven, eight, something like that. Uh, they, the, the people that own that restaurant had that horse. And, and so it's always fun. It's very racing centric, uh, same vibe there. You can, you know, see a lot of kind of the, the racing to who and, and Del Mar, you know, Matt's always fun. Um, and then, uh, Sabika, which have you been there? Have I been there with you Pete before? I, we've never been to Sabika, but I did go back in the day with uh, my friend, the racing writer, the late, great, uh, William Murray and Frank Scatoni, who sent us an impressive download of Del Mar information that I don't want to, that I don't want to leave out, but uh, yeah, that's at Del Mar Plaza, isn't it? Across from the bird. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the plaza is. Yeah. Um, and then other just classic ones. We've talked about the brig, you know, fish tacos at the brig or, or a few drinks at the brig uh, and, and some fish tacos before, before, during, or after the races kind of fun. I remember a couple times sneaking out before the last and watching the last from the brig and being able to see them live on the track from the restaurant. Very cool. Uh, Red Tractons, classic, old school Del Mar. But let me run through some of this stuff from Frank before we move on. And then you can uh, insert a couple more Del Mar ideas, JK. Um, he is a huge fan of... Uh, of the, it's a great line, actually. He says he thinks there are more coffee shops per capita in North County than there are bars in Ireland. <laughs> but he gives a tip to Phil's, P-H-I-L-Z, in Encinitas on the 101. I've been to a Phil's location. I think it was in Pasadena. And I agree. Very, very good. He describes it as a nice, airy space with a comfy couch for the comfy couch for handicapping and calls the coffee the absolute best in the area. And he also uh, tips the app so you can order your coffee in advance and it'll be ready on arrival. Um, and he also he also tips the, the iced tea there. So this is good. You know, you and I, we go straight to the to the hard stuff. It's good for, for you know, consider the fact that people are going to want to have breakfast and, and coffee as well along the way. And speaking of breakfast, he says, you know, Solana Beach area, uh, very close to the track. Lots of options. Claire's on Cedros is the best of the bunch, and he gives the, he gives a tip to the fact that they have some healthy as well as delicious choices. Uh, he says you're going to probably end your day if you're going to the racetrack with unhealthy choices. Why not start with a healthy one? He says, uh, you know, the, the, the service is not the best, so if you're in a hurry, that's not the place. But if you've got, like, that extra hour – uh, to kill before the races. Maybe it means it's a good place to go on a Friday when you won't be in such a hurry. He he talks about some of the beer situation in the area, giving a special mention to the Viewpoint Brewing Company. Um, that is across the street on Jimmy Durante. And he says it's just a year old, good space, outdoor seating, good view of the lagoon. Um, and uh, parking, he says, is a little ropey there, so you might want to keep that in mind. And then he also mentions Culture Brewing Company on Cedros in Solana Beach, which he says is a great place to hit before you uh, catch a show with the belly up, which is the great rock club, world-famous rock club, where the Rolling Stones have even played right there in Solana Beach, somewhere else to check out. Um, he has a tip on wine right across the street from there is the Caruth, I think it's probably pronounced Caruth or Caruth Cellars Urban Winery. If you're a wine person, not a beer person. And then I'm curious what he's going to say about restaurants. He and I used to eat at so many places in and around there, but apparently there's some other uh, new good ones. Campfire in Carlsbad is one that he tips and he says, get the s'mores for dessert. Um, and then he says, I like this quote, I'll just read it. If you want something a little more hipsterish, but not overly pretentious, Juniper and Ivy in Little Italy is fantastic. Changes the menu weekly, wide assortment of small plates, which is great. You can order a bunch of things and taste if you want to have a bunch of things. And he says, if you're going for a special occasion, let them know they'll go out of their way to treat you right. And he says, uh, Little Italy is something you can really make a night of the food hall down there to check out. If you feel like going into downtown San Diego, when I go there, I never leave North County, but that sounds, that sounds good. A couple other just quickies from him. 
uh, ice cream, handles homemade ice cream and yogurt on the 101. He says it's a weight, but it's worth it. And then he makes he says to make sure to mention Jimmy O's and in Fuego in Del Mar for nightlife. Um, the drunken set, the older set, drunkenly singing along to the piano player at Red Tractons, and he says that's a race tracky, as is the saddle bar. So we have like nine million things. Oh, one more I'll give. He does give a more civilized nightlife tip for Crush on 101 in Solana Beach, an Italian restaurant with a nice bar area and live music every night. Think of it as a refined supper club experience, urbane and sophisticated, but not uptight at all. This guy missed his calling. You know, he does a great job at those Del Mar. Uh, newcomer seminars out there. He's going to be doing the Sunday seminar at Del Mar this year. Clearly, he should be a food and and uh, and restaurant uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, cultural critic, don't you think, J.K.? Yeah, he's making me look bad. I'm about to plug a waffle with bacon in it. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I, I love going to La Jolla, which is you know 30, 30, uh, 30 not too many, twenty minutes up the road from or down the road, I guess, south of Del Mar. Uh, there's a place called Harry's, it's like a, like a kind of an old school diner type place. Um, sit on the patio. They have a waffle that like they make like have bacon bits in it. It's great. Um, so I'm a big fan of Harry's in La Jolla. Uh, there's a place called George's in La Jolla that's got like one of the best views. Uh, not as good as Pacific Coast Grill, but it's uh it's it's right there and it's got a cool little patio you can sit out on and. And so I'm, I'm always a fan of, of, of going over there. And then you can walk down and check out all the sea lions that are down, um, like Sea Lion Beach, uh, that's like right there uh, in, in, the, in the cove, in La Jolla Cove. And, and, and this is another spot. You sent me there. I enjoyed the, the Brockton Villa as well. Yeah, Brockton Villa for me, that, that's my must. That's another one of those places where the blood pressure just lowers for me, and I have to check it out. Let's not give a short trip to Saratoga. We do a lot of our eating in Saratoga in the backyard. Um, Oh, before we leave Del Mar, we needed a whole hour just to talk about the eating and drinking, and I did not realize that. We're going to run a little over here tonight because I think we're going to have to. Um, but as long as we're talking about Del Mar, places to watch at the track. People always want to know that. I don't know how easy it is or hard it is to get a table at the Veranda Cafe, I think they call it. That's one of my favorite spots to watch. I'm also just a big fan of um, – attempting to go down and look at the horses for the paddock and just sort of wandering upstairs and watching on the watching on the screens outside the veranda where we wa of course watch the, the the gun runner win at the breeders cup where do you like to watch the races at del mar yeah you know del mar and saratoga both are one of those places where for me if i'm at the racetrack i try to watch the race live i try my hardest doesn't always happen but i try my hardest when I'm at the racetrack to watch it live. Now, what happens, I think, sometimes at those places is those live seating areas are a little bit pricier. So I always find myself kind of finding a great hangout spot where I can, like, kind of walk to go watch the race live and then go back to my hangout spot. And the veranda is one of those for me. You sit down. It looks over the paddock. You're out in the, in the sun a little bit. But you still have the umbrellas to keep you covered. Uh, I mean, the food is, like, it's the food. It's not, you know, it's not going to change your life or anything, but it'll keep you from being hungry. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of a cool vibe. Del Mar is kind of fun just to walk around. Though. I, I like to just kind of move around Del Mar and go see, you know, TQ at Quigley's Corner and, and, uh, and, and all of those places. If you can somehow get up to the sixth floor and you can, if you play in the contest, it's one of the best views, I think, in racing, you know, playing in that contest and being able to sit in that room up on the sixth floor. I'm not familiar with what happens in other situations about getting a table up there. It seems to be some open dining areas where you can probably buy or reserve tickets or whatever. But uh, sitting up there is always a ton of fun. Absolutely. Um, let's talk Saratoga. We'll start with the same question, where to watch. For me, it's all about sort of what you're looking at. Uh, in terms of racing experience, most days you can buy day of seats. I think for your first experience at Saratoga, it's not a horrible idea to try to get clubhouse or even grandstand seats and watch some races live. Even if you only spend part of the day there, it's a good place to sort of soak it up and check out the history. There are dining options over there. But I mean, I just I, and they're cool, but I don't think they're necessarily the absolute best value for money uh the, the, the those places but i mean i'll we, we'll do the turf club once a meet the porch is nice hard to get a table and 
you know, I just, for me, there are, there are better ways to enjoy the Saratoga experience. For some people, going with a group of friends, you want to do the picnic thing at a table in the backyard, you know, that is, we know we have friends who do that every single day, and it's a, it's a fun way to go and something else that, depending on how many people you have and what kind of experience you're looking for, you might want to check out. For me, obviously, the best place to hang out, we talk about it every show, pretty much, the Paddock Bar, unbelievable. You've got it ain't fancy food, but it's real good food. You got your Shake Shack there, uh, as well as the uh, the the, the taqueria, um, which so you know they're serving they're serving tasty bites of food, and you have a chance to see every horse on the grounds as they walk out. The post bar is right there, the only free pour bar on the track, uh, which is value for money right there. And they make good drinks. And it's great people and great atmosphere. And, you know, I'll be there, uh, you know, 35 of the of the 40 days of the meet. <laughs> so I, I I certainly have to mention that as a place to hang out. Even if you're they, in one they of did the- vote, They did vote you the president. You know, they voted you the president. <laughs> yeah, they made me the they president. Did. They made you king. That was the problem. Um, <laughs> but listen, if you're the president of the post bar, I don't want you talking to the president of, of, of the bar upstairs now. Where it leads to trouble. <laughs> We'll keep that. We'll keep. I'll take that under advisement. I, I try to serve my king uh, and not mess around with these things. Even if you're at one of the other places, um, I, I, if whatever you do, come by there for a drink at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's just, it's super fun. Now, I know you typically, uh, you're, you, you probably don't have too much more than that to add, or do you, when it comes to uh, enjoying the stuff? No, I, I mean, I, you know, some of the other dining room areas are cool. Um, I don't know the name of it, so I feel bad. But at the at the you you might know it, Pete. But at the wire, like or, or maybe a little bit past the wire, there's kind of a first floor, uh, you know, covered dining room area that That's has a still porch. cool vibe. You can That's see the, the horses galloping up. What's it called? The porch. The porch. I, I I sat there one day, like on a Sunday, and it was cool. I I didn't mind it at all. So. Um, you know, it's 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 a hard place to get like the full racing action unless you sit in the boxes. And I think when you sit in the box, you gotta have a jacket on. So uh, yeah, clubhouse you know, makes a lot more sense, I think, uh, for most people. Though the boxes are a fun experience, and if you catch a cold spell, I mean, you want to talk about soaking up the history. I, I, for me, it's a place you want to sort of divide it up and do it. If you've never been, do it a bunch of different ways, and you're gonna find your spot and you're gonna find your people. There's this new area this year too. The what used to be just grandstand seats down by the turn uh, near that top of the stretch area, they have converted into some new thing that's worth uh, that's worth checking out. Um, let's move on, I think, JK, to talk about um, dining options around Saratoga. Well, we, we were joking before. We eat in the in, we eat in the backyard a lot. We eat at at Shake Shack a lot. What are some of the meals you've had there that have uh, that have really impressed you? Uh, I guess I got to start with the place that last year I went to on back-to-back nights by choice. Um, <laughs> Usually, and that was Bo- yeah, that was Boca Bistro. Um, they have this like paella that is like unbelievable. It's so good, and and uh, so I, I'm a big fan of Boca Bistro. Uh, Salt and Char is one of those remarkable steakhouses that you can uh, go into, and it's pricey, and you, you'll, you, you'll 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 pay a little bit, but it's a it's really cool. I've, I've always enjoyed going there. Um, Back when I and used then, to occasionally beat you in, in bets, you had to buy uh, me and Sumja dinner there, and uh, I, I raided the wine list that night at Salt and Char. That was an absolute blast. That was a strong one. That was a strong one. I, I do remember that. Um, yeah, I, I do remember that. And then um, uh, Hattie's is, is, all, is a, a local must. legend. A must. Yeah. But I'll say this about Hattie's. It is great, um, but it can be crowded and slow. And if you so, if you can't deal with that, our wise guy Hattie's move. There's a second Hattie's out at the mall that, if you're in a like a cool place to to, to stay, um, you might consider getting takeout from the other Hattie's. You can get takeout actually from the main Hattie's too, and then take your takeout home. You know, nothing beats, in my opinion, sitting around with a nice bottle of champagne and some uh, Hattie's fried chicken. That's a frequent thing we'll do on the night on the way in. Driving up, we're getting into town, get the Hattie's takeout, bring it home, you know, just drop the bags on the floor, 
dig into the fried chicken and open a nice bottle of champagne. That 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 is a that is the wise guy move with Hatties, and that is an absolute must. I'm glad you mentioned it. Places on Broadway, uh, that bar at Max London's is fun. Um, you know the food the food's all right, and uh, you know Saratoga service all almost all across the board can be a little touch and go. But uh, I, I like sitting at the bar there. There's some you want on TV. They'll, they, you know, they've usually got they've got two good size screens, and um, you, you know, you'll be able to watch racing or the baseball game, etc. At the bar at Max's, um, is it 16 Church? Is that the the fine dining place on Church that is can, 15, 15, 15, 15 Church? 15. A lot that one we've gone a couple of times. We've had some good experiences there. That's on a lot of people's short list. Pete, um, what was that breakfast spot? You, I went to one called Sweet Mimi's that was good, but then we all went, me, you, Perrin, and Austin all went to one. Kind of a little bit more of an old school vibe. We had, there was a little bit of a wait. We kind of sat in the corner. It's on the corner. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, that It's right next to 15 Church, uh, yeah. and it's called like the country, the country Kitchen or the Country Corner Cafe. Great the the good news is that 15, 15 Church is the address, I think. Yes. I'm almost positive. So so if you can find 15 Church, you can find this other breakfast spot. You know, uh, uh, the, the Corner Prince Cafe. of Keeneland. Country Corner Cafe. Yeah, we'll go. The Prince of Keeneland and I went to this spot a couple of times while I was there. It's kind of a quick, fast spot, but it's still quality food. It's kind of you go up and you order and they bring it out to you, but it's really good. It's called um, uh, Farmer's Hardware. Yeah. Yeah, new, but uh, good Bloody Mary at Farmer's Hardware. And and kind of a cool, um, just kind of a different look um, and a good addition a good addition to the town for sure. The day I went in there, I had my, my one negative, and I'm sure they fixed it by now, but I, I had a Wi-Fi issue, which, which uh, uh, I, I'm sure, like I said, is fixed by now. That was the, the, the only thing that, that went wrong there. But it was good. It was good eats, and I definitely tipped the Bloody Mary. A um, couple of uh, one that's that's farther off the beaten path that I love, and I'm going to give it. Sometimes I think I shouldn't tell too many people because when it gets too crowded, they run out of turkey early, and and that's no good. But Winslow's, which is out on that same road where the wishing well is, Winslow's in Saratoga, that is sort of a wise guy place. You will see horse people in there for sure. Um, and the thing you want is basically you do the full thanksgiving dinner in july or august as the case may be have we ever taken you there i don't i feel like you haven't been i haven't i haven't been there nope all right we're gonna do winslow's this year one of your visits and you can see the picture there on the screen you you do the you do the full turkey dinner extremely reasonably priced not really a, i mean there there is beer it's it's not like for your you know beer uh connoisseurship etc et type of a place but it is it is uh it's one where you definitely have to check it out um what else did i have on my list oh for beer love henry street tap room uh, a beer li- very hip beer list that is worthy of uh you know you you it, it would it hangs with the good beer list in brooklyn lots of good local things there is a new and i'm gonna forget the name and it's gonna upset me there's a new place that does growler. It's not really a bar. It's more growler fills and a bottle shop uh, on Broadway. That's very good for beer. I'm going to dig for the name of that. And then cocktail wise, got a tip. My friends at Hamlet and ghost tremendous cocktails right in the middle of town. Um, All right. I feel like I've given most of my good stuff. You have any others from there? Um, you know, I, I like hanging out at Sperry's. It's cool. Like after the races or like late night, like after dinner, if you're walking down Caroline street and you want to swing into Sperry's, it's usually fun. A lot of racing people in there and, and, uh, you can, you can maybe run into some, you know, I, I see Andy Serling there often. So I'm sure he'd love for you to tell him that you're mad at him or something, but, um, uh, that one's always Don't good. And that. then, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. And then, um, uh, the other one that um is always kind of cool to go to is and i'm going i obviously i don't know why i'm going blank what's the one right across the street from the track the zeros um, zero where i used to work where i uh one of my first gigs with daily racing form working with harvey pack and the aforementioned andy serling on on those seminars there it's fun for a pop after the after the races live music 
Um, you know, it's it, it, you're supposed to go there or the horseshoe after the race is one night, especially if you're uh, especially if you're new. Um, and, you know, look around, see what there's, especially during those hats off nights, there's live music all over the place. Lots of good stuff going on. You know, it's hard not to have fun up there. Here's the place I was trying to come up with before, Pint Sized. Another good place for beer, uh, one in Albany, one in Saratoga. All right, we've done an hour. We've talked about some handicapping angles. We've talked about some uh, places to eat and drink and watch. Let's add – I'm hoping you have another 10 minutes for us, JK. Let's talk some specifics Uh Let's blow through some races on the opening day, Saratoga and Del Mar cards. Let's start with Del Mar. Uh, anything clever for us on this card? Where do you figure to be focusing your action? You know, I, I'm going well, to be looking at both. Uh, you know, obviously with Del Mar being tomorrow, that'll be fun. I'm going to play in some contests on, on tournaments.drf. They're going to do all Del Mar tomorrow. So and, I'm going to do an all Del Mar. Yeah, I think it's all Del Mar Wednesday and Thursday. Lots of good stuff going on on DRF tournaments. And and keep your eyes out for a special contest potentially happening on uh, on Friday. Oh, while I'm talking things about Saratoga, before we get too far, I do want to mention I'm going to be hosting seminars on track at Saratoga. I believe they're going to be the second floor of the carousel this year. Every Saturday, 11 to 11.30. Great lineup of guests if you can stand uh, the little guy from Texas who's gonna, who I'm going to make be on like three times. Come and see us, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. 11 to 11.30, second floor, carousel. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I like our walk. Uh, the, 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 I liked the horse last time at Santa Anita when he, when he ran against uh, River Boyne. Um, Got what's the got a curious ride uh, there, and and I think that uh, that horse has a lot more ability than than we saw uh, last time, and 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 I thought the horse had some excuses at Churchill, so I'll give that one another shot. I'll use the five horse that Corey Nakatani's on as well, but the one horse is the type of horse I'll probably use in contest. So the one and the five for you in the ocean side. Did you look at any of these other races at Del Mar? What is there a particular gimmick you might be looking to sink your teeth into? No, but I, you know, here's what I will tell you is if you, I mean, I looked at race seven. If you look at race seven, it's a five furlong uh, maiden special weight for the two year old fillies. Uh, this article, this reminded me of an article that if you have not read yet, you need to pull it up and read it. And it's an article by uh, by Jay Pridman. He does it every year. Uh, it's titled, if you want to look it up, it's titled Juvenile Wealth Spread Among Many This Summer. And I, and and from my understanding, I don't know this from him directly, but it seemed exactly like what he does. I believe he goes around, he talks to all these barns. He's got great relationships being the beat guy out there. And he asks, you know, who who, who are your good two-year-olds? Who are the two-year-olds that we can be paying attention to or, or be thinking about? And these guys, you know, they, they'll share that information. And one of my favorite things to do is run through here and grab them and add them all to my stable mail so I know when they enter. Because sometimes what will happen is you'll see a horse that will show up in the in the in in a maiden race on a Thursday. Um and the workout report won't will be fine, but it won't be buzzing. And there could be some other thing that's buzzing in there. And you'll forget that this is one of Peter Miller's favorite two-year-olds he has. And it's some valuable information that you can help. And it's also fun just to keep track of them and see how many of these things actually pan out. DRF Stable Mail, a great tool for that. Jay does a fantastic job covering the meat throughout. But that piece is a perennial favorite. You can find it there over on DRF.com. Did you have an opinion yet for this seventh race? Was there a horse from there that shows up in here? What are you? Where are you gonna go? No, I, I, this is this is one where I want to definitely see the workout report from the horses that have run uh, Bizwax for for Doug O'Neill. Uh, that horse ran well, showing speed last time at Santa Anita. You know, it comes back here, obviously could could run a little bit better second off. But uh, Angel Alessandro was one of the horses that was listed on 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 Prigman's, uh piece so it's one that you want to kind of keep your eye out for i'll reserve judgment so i'll look at the workout report yeah certainly looks good uh off the workout tab from san louis ray one that wouldn't surprise me one bit if it was bet down below that five to one of the morning line anything else for del mar opening day jk or should we move our tack east yeah we'll head east to saratoga to the spa i like it and we will be doing a show on saturday 
um, where we will go into depth on the, 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 the those races, including the stakes for Saturday. For opening day, you want to just look at the stakes, or do you want to talk about the late pick four? Uh, the, uh, the stakes probably. I, I, I'm, I'm not fully ready to rock and roll with the other two. That's, that's fine. It's 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 early in the week. People are going to understand that, and we're we're over time anyway. So a couple of thoughts on these stakes, and we'll let everybody get on with their lives. Yeah, it, it seems like the the Mark Cassie horses can run a little bit here. He's got uh, he has uh, what, three, three in here. He has three and he's got three and Norm's, Norm's got one. <laughs> Uh, which where do, do you land on one of those or do you look elsewhere? No, I, I think I'm going to look elsewhere. Uh, I think of the ones that are there, Eye in the Sky feels the most interesting to me. Uh, the Serengeti Express has the nice time form figure, the 96. Unfortunately, none of those horses have run back in Indiana uh, from Indiana uh, since July 4th. Obviously, kind of not too quick, but quick enough. Uh, gets Javier Castellano, Tom Amos. Usually can get one ready to rock and roll here. Uh, this one was bet down to one to five last time. I think the other ones will take money, and this Tom Amos horse could be forgotten a little bit. A little bit of value drawn outside. Should get a good trip. Uh, I think that uh, that one could be tough. I like it. Let's move on to the sort of co-featured uh, race on the day. The Lake George. Uh, here's a surprise. Chad Brown has a couple in here. Yeah, he's, 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 here's the surprise. Surprise, you got a couple in here, but the surprise is he doesn't have one in here that, that I think a lot of people thought was going to be here, and that's Rushing Fall. Uh, Rushing Fall, the two-year-old champion, uh, the horse that that uh, that uh, was either uh, aggressively ridden or or aggressively put herself into the edge wood at Churchill, uh, but the, the horse that was affected by that most or, or, uh, was, or at least impacted her chances of winning is Daddy is a Legend uh, for George Weaver and Manny Franco. That horse shows up here. Uh, I've always thought she was talented. She ran huge that day at Churchill. Uh, wasn't as impressive in the Wonder again, uh, but but I like what happened there. The Wonder again was a mile and an eighth. They had the option, obviously, to then go on to the Belmont Derby going a mile and a quarter. Uh, but George decided uh, that he wants to go a little bit shorter for whatever reason and, and shows up here in the Lake George. Uh, I think Daddy is a legend. It's going to be a square price because we know how these two Chad horses are going to be bet. Chad gets... You know, when, when Travis Stone was doing the, 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 the uh, morning line, he let us know that there's a, a couple of points you always have to assign to Chad where horses get bet down a little bit more than they should, uh, but most of the time they win. Well, exactly. They, they, when you're just looking at what his return on investment is, uh, you, you, you could argue they don't, get, uh, they don't get bet down enough. But back to Daddy as a legend. Yeah, you said Belmont Derby. You meant Oaks, of course. But yeah, that is it's sort of a weird running line, a race that didn't have much in the way of pace. She's very interesting to me coming back. And Weaver, one of those trainers who, I mean, obviously it's it's uh, so many trainers point for for these meets. George Weaver is somebody who points for these meets and does it really well. And if you break down and look at different categories for his, his horses outrun their odds at Saratoga. I'm very happy. He's a trainer I'm happy to include in a spread race just because it's him at Saratoga or just do a little bit more with a horse like Daddy is a legend. Um, she's definitely um, going to be heavy in what I'm doing on opening day. Uh, I look forward, JK. We're going to talk more about uh, especially the Saratoga meet. We may have our first ever – I have to wait for confirmation, but we may have our first ever sponsored podcast when we uh, join you back, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on Friday, we're going to talk more about the Saratoga meet. We're going to dive into the stakes on the Del Mar Saturday card and, of course, the Saratoga Saturday card. It's going to be great. Any further closing thoughts, JK, from you about either of these meetings before we, we, we send it home? Don't let either trip be all about the, uh, about the gambling, the food, and the, uh, the adult beverages. Uh, if you go to Del Mar, get over by Torrey Pines, and, and there's a bunch of little places over there you can hike. That's always a lot of fun. In Saratoga, there's too many good lakes not to get out there and go hang out on the lake one day. Pete and I rented a, a tiki, floating tiki thing one time. I guess that, that doesn't uh, – I, I guess I, I didn't – I forgot there was drinks on there, but then whatever. Who cares? Bring, bring Kool-Aid. <laughs> we'll give you – that. that's our best – 
tip. Who knows? Maybe we'll, if, if enough people do this, maybe we can get a free ride from uh, Captain Colleen and the crew. I think this is the site here, this Tiki Tours. Um, absolute blast, little sunset boat ride. It goes about five miles an hour, but a chance to experience the lake. Uh, great hiking up there, too. Uh, whether you're just going up to Skidmore or and hiking around the woods there, which is the real wise guy move if you have a dog, or you're going and doing a proper hike up by Lake George. Buck Mountain is Susan's favorite, and we always do try to get some healthy things. And you'll see me out there. If you're listening to this show and you're going to be in Saratoga, the whole meet, at some point you'll see me in that handicapping Labrador out there uh, running through the town. you you got to do something to try to work off all those double shack burgers, not to mention the various adult beverages. Thanks a lot, JK. Appreciate your time and insights. There's going to be a lot more on Friday. Sorry we didn't get to more questions. Feel free to hit us up. Um, I can go back and look at the archive of questions, but also feel free to send some stuff to podcast at drf.com. I think we're also going to try to bring in special guest Scott Carson, who's working on a really cool project for Saratoga for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes on uh, on Friday's show. That should be a lot of fun. If not this Friday, we'll bring Scott in at some point next week. I want him to talk about this cool thing that he's doing, and he's always great to have on the show, successful contest player and former winner at Saratoga. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. We, we really appreciate the support, and a lot of you signed up to help us out, and, and that's just fantastic if you want to check this out in archive uh it's going to be made into a normal podcast feed it should show up there but you can also go to drf.com slash youtube and check it out that way i'm peter thomas fornital we will be back on friday may you win all your photos